Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Corey Ross. I'm a board member for the Southeastern Vermont Audubon Society. Thank you for joining us for our November program. Um, before I introduce this evening's presenter, presenter, I want to go over a couple of upcoming events that may be of interest. Our next Birds and Brews event is this Thursday, November 18th at the Lounge in downtown Brattleboro from 5 to 7. And you can just drop by anytime between 5 and 7. Uh, they'll have I think, light appetizers available and drinks. And we'll just talk about birds and nature and kind of whatever folks feel like talking about this month. So it can be a fun social outing. Um, and then the Christmas bird count is coming up December 18th. Um, the, you can join that either by joining one of our field teams and going out and surveying the area for birds, or you can conduct a feeder count from your home, provided you're inside the count circle. The information you'll need to sign up for that is on our website, which I'm gonna put in the chat box. Um, if you have participated in the past and you know who your team leader is, you can just communicate with them directly. You don't have to tell me. But if you're new, um, you can use the sign up form on our website and I can help you find a team to join. Or if you want to do a feeder count, I can get you the instructions. Um, I really encourage folks, if, if you have any interest in this and haven't done it before, at least do a feeder count. Even if all you do is spend five minutes checking your feeders during the day, that can actually be really valuable data. Um, give us information about uh, can give us good information about you know what's visiting feeders in various parts of the count circle and even if you just kind of look out at breakfast and write down hey I saw three cardinals two chickadees and a sparrow and then you never look at your feeders again that day you know tell us that you spent that amount of time and those are the birds you saw and, and that's good information to share with the National Audubon Society oh, watch um, and then we do monthly content on these programs. If you have interesting sightings from recording. recent days that you would like to share with us, um, please feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, I can give one um, just this evening after work. There was a raft of northern shovelers at the Sir Sosimo setbacks um, in Brattleboro, which quite a few folks were lucky enough to see this evening. I think there were 15 or 16 or maybe 17, which is we think maybe the high record for the state. So pretty cool sighting for this late in the season. Are there other either birds or, or wildlife in general sightings folks want to share? The county said if it's just eating breakfast, but the birds, you know, you see. You're also more than welcome to put them in the chat box if you prefer. Uh, three or four days ago, we had 15 red-winged blackbirds. <laughs> A little late. We thought so. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. We're going to have 15 of something. I would have preferred something else, but hey. <laughs> would have preferred evening girl speaks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Went away. <laughs> they were a little shocking. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Corey. Saturday morning, there was a beautiful Northern Harrier working a uh, farm field on Higley Hill Road in Marlboro. Nice. <clears throat> I, uh, the other night I saw a, um, <clears throat> I don't know if I can be heard. Yep. I yeah, saw, yeah. I, okay. I saw a large um, flock of crows thinking back to last winter and where they were roosting. And I was driving up Main Street and they, and I wanted, I was trying to watch and go through stoplights at the same time. And they sort of came up, came south on Main Street and then went up High Street. And I'd be very curious to know where they went because there was a large number. Okay. Uh, so nice. <clears throat> if anybody is an iNaturalist user, um, you can share any observations you make of crows on there and tag the what called Vermont Crow Project, I think. Um, and they can people can use that to try to track down where the roosts are. Cool. Any other bird sightings before I introduce our presenter? Okay. Um, this evening's presenter is Caitlin McDonald, who is a PhD student um, in the Cottingham Lab at Dartmouth College. 
um, and she'll be presenting on the community ecology of ticks. Um, she wanted me to mention that she's um, happy to answer questions throughout. So, and she won't be able to see you because she'll be looking at her presentation. So if you just want to unmute yourself and ask a question, you can, um, or you can also put them in the chat box and I can relay them to her. Um, please join me in welcoming Caitlin McDonald. Thanks, Corey. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Please let me know if you can't. Uh, yeah, like Corey said, I am a PhD student at Dartmouth College. Um, I study ticks. Uh, mostly I, I try to understand sort of where they are, why they're there. Um, I might be the only person who actively looks for them and likes finding them. <laughs> um, so, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the community ecology of ticks. And so by community ecology, I sort of mean the organization and functioning of communities. So interacting groups of species um, within a particular area or habitat. And so when I talk about the community ecology of ticks, I'm actually talking about the way in, the way in which ticks sort of interact with uh, other species and vice versa. And so this evening, I'm going to start uh, very generally by giving a little bit of background on the species of tick that I study. Um, and then I'll sort of move on to the questions that motivate my own research and a few ways that we approach these questions um, in our preliminary field work uh, that we did this past summer. And then I'll talk a little bit about our current understanding and share a few results from the research that we did. And then I'll end with a few potential options for, for this research to kind of continue. So when I talk about a tick, um, I, I like to kind of start out with talking about what is a tick. And at its most basic level, a tick is an animal. Um, and so what you'll see sort of on the slide is just the scientific classification of ticks. Um, and it really doesn't mean very much other than situating it within um, the larger, broader scheme of, of animals. Um, and so at its most basic level, it, it's a, it's an animal. Uh, it's part of the animal kingdom. But but after that, it gets a little bit more specific. Um, and so a tick is an arthropod, um, but it is technically not an insect, which uh, is interesting. And that is because all insects are arthropods, meaning they're invertebrates. They have exoskeletons, segmented bodies, uh, paired jointed appendages. appendages. Um, but not all arthropods are insects. And so an ex a few examples of arthropods that are not insects include um, spiders, for instance, which you'll see on the screen, um, lobsters, centipedes, and interestingly, ticks. Um, and so ticks are most closely related to mites, which is that little red thing in the top right-hand corner, and spiders, which is on the left. Um, they belong to a super order of parasitic forms, um, meaning that they require a host organism for food, um, which is unfortunately sometimes humans. Uh, and as we move into order family genus, uh, we sort of begin to narrow it down. And for the sake of brevity, uh, there, are there are essentially um, two types of ticks. They are what we would consider hard ticks, which are the ones we most commonly see here in, in uh, Vermont. And then there are soft ticks. And the family um, Exotidae comprises the hard tick species of which there are approximately 700 known species. And of those 700 species, um, I'm interested in one, and that is the Exodes scapularis tick, but that it's more commonly known as the black leg tick or the deer tick. Um, and so this is this is great. We've sort of situated our, our tick, um, and, that, and that sorry, that's a picture of it, um, sort of in the bottom right hand corner. Um, so and, you know we're all we're all sort of aware aware of what they they look like. Um, but so now that we've sort of situated it into the broader uh, context of of animals, um, what does a tick actually do? And so uh, like I said, ticks are parasites, and so that means that they require hosts, uh, specifically a host's blood. And so um, we call this obligate uh, hemophotagous parasitism, but that just basically means that in order for them to survive, they need blood. Um, and we know that they live, or this, this particular species, and, and I will only really refer from this point on to this particular species because this is the focus of my research. Um, they live for approximately two years and they exhibit some seasonal activity, which is why we don't see them all year round. 
Um, and their life cycle is pretty straightforward. Uh, they hatch from an egg uh, and they hatch into a larva. And so in the top right part of the screen, you're gonna see this sort of like um, spiral diagram. And that is just a diagram from the CDC that kind of shows us the life cycle. So we'll follow it, we'll follow it from the center kind of in an outward direction. Um, and they hatch from an egg mass um, into a very tiny larva, which is that little, little tiny poppy size, uh, poppy seed size thing all the way to the left-hand side in the middle picture of that finger. Um, so they're, they're, they're terrifically small. Um, and they emerge from the egg at that size and they start their first ever search for a host. And like I said, at this, at this point, they're extremely small about the size of a poppy seed. And, and because they're so small, they're especially at the mercy of the elements, particularly humidity. So they tend to stay in the leaf litter where it's nice and humid. So below sort of the leaf litter kind of in that. Um, and, it, and it's here that they, they will find their first host, typically whatever is crawling through the leaf litter. So it's, it's most frequently small mammals. Um, and then after their first blood meal, um, so after they attach to their first host, uh, kind of take take their take their meal and then they retreat back into the leaf litter and they molt like most invertebrates do um, and and typically they will overwinter after they've molted so it takes them a little bit of time to move from one life stage to the next so um, if we're looking at that middle picture again from moving sort of to the left to the right um, it, it it takes them it takes them a little bit of time so so that is kind of where on that spiral you'll see will go from a larva and then summer, fall and winter will happen. And then um, a nymph will emerge. And that's the second life stage. Um, and, and as nymphs, they emerge in the spring and begin to yet again, seek a host. And at this life stage, they're, they're a little bit bigger um, and a little bit beefier. And so they can withstand slightly drier conditions, which allows them to look for hosts a little ways outside of the leaf litter. Um, so we can think about them as sort of going like up vertically outside of the leaf litter. Um, however, they're still extremely, at this stage, extremely small and hard to see, which is what makes this particular stage so dangerous to humans. Um, and the, the, the nymphal stage for, uh, for sort of a picture is the, the second tick in moving towards the right-hand side in that, in that slide. I apologize, in no way, shape or form, are they easy to kind of like show people um, and so the nymph will continue to, uh, to look for a host. And once it has, it will feed again and drop off into the leaf litter and will molt for the very last time. Um, and it will emerge as an adult and will look for its last host. And so, um, I don't know if you guys can see my pointer on the screen. Um, but the, the sort of last two ticks, the two largest ticks are a male and female respectively. Um, so those, those two larger ticks are, are both in their adult stage. Um, and because the, this species of ticks, this species of tick looks for hosts at three points throughout its life, um, we call this a three host tick. And so black leg ticks or deer ticks are three host ticks. And um, they are generalists, meaning they will attach themselves to pretty much anything. Um, so they, you know, they kind of don't discriminate between um, animals or humans, um, which is why it can be so problematic. Um, they really will parasitize anything except for amphibians. Um, and they are typically um, able to go unnoticed by their hosts, including humans, due to these sort of immunosuppressive proteins in their saliva. Um, so, so their saliva, their spit sort of produces um, something that doesn't allow the human body or the mammalian body to, to detect them when they're um, feeding. And so um, the picture on the on the left hand side is of is a is a really, really um, close up picture of a, of a tick's mouth parts. And so that little spiky thing is um, what's technically called the the hypostome. And that is the part that sort of like inserts into the skin. And um, yeah, really, really interesting. Um, and so these immunosuppressive proteins and this small size are really great adaptations because it takes them a few days to sort of feed until they're full. Um, 
And I've mentioned um, a couple of times these ticks kind of like looking for a host and attaching to a host and, and all of these different things. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting behavior that I thought I would take a couple of minutes to talk about. Um, and ticks um, actively looking for hosts, including humans, is called questing. They quest for hosts. And I, I have a quick video to kind of show you what it looks like. I don't, I don't know how many people have seen that. Usually you just kind of see them on, on you and you're like, oh my goodness, get this off of me. Um, so let me know if, if the video plays okay. Um, so yeah, you can see it kind of crawling up the, the, the grass stem, the plant material and, and waving its little two forelegs around um, looking for hosts. And they're prompted to do this behavior, to, to actively seek a host um, if they receive some sort of external sim stimulus, something like CO2 emission from a nearby animal or a human um, movement. And then they're prompted to sort of move towards it, hoping to be able to attach. Um, and you'll notice in the, in, in the video um, that these, these ticks can't move very fast. This, this species of tick is actually quite slow moving. And they're, they're, they're very small, so they can't move very far on their own. Um, they, don't, they don't fly, um, and they typically don't crawl very far um, on the ground. They, they tend to kind of stay in one place. And so in order to move across big areas or large spaces, they require hosts for dispersal. Um, and, and, and this is part of what makes them so interesting because this behavior is also how they attach to humans. It's how it's, it's a necessary part of their life um, and their life cycle because um, it's how they successfully re end up reproducing. And so um, we know that even though they're small moving and they can't uh, move very fast um, and they are sort of limited in, in, in sort of where they can exist, they seem to be attaching to humans um, more frequently than they have in the past. Um, and this is sort of causing um, an increase in the reported cases of tick-borne disease. Um, and so these maps are from 2001 and 2018. Um, they're both from the CDC and it's a sort of uh, comparison of disease cases, Lyme disease cases um, that were reported to a health department, a hospital, what have you, and then reported to the CDC across time. And so compared from 2001 on the left-hand side to 2018 on the right-hand side, there has been a significant increase, especially in the Northeast. Um, and so this increase um, is, is troubling and, and worrisome um, because this increase in tick-borne disease might suggest that perhaps there is an increase in the number of ticks uh, that we see. And that seems to be the case. Um, the abundance of ticks are, are likely increasing. And so this map, um, these sorry, these two maps are from a study that was conducted um, in 2016 um, that was building off of, of a previous study that had been done um, a while ago that sort of looked at the uh, distribution of ticks by county. Um, and so they uh, were looking at sort of public records or other research that um, had recorded the presence of ticks um, in either two life stages in each county. So someone found two ticks of, of, uh, two, at two different life stages, which kind of um, gives, a, gives us the notion that they are establishing a population. They're like reproducing and kind of sticking that area versus like an individual that maybe just dispersed that far via a host or something. Um, so, it, so it seems that they are, are sort of increasing across uh, space and time. And this is really interesting uh, because ticks have actually been on the North American continent for, for many, many thousands of years. And so why kind of are they increasing now? What is, and, and, and you know, sort of anecdotally, this is, people have noticed, you know, some, some people have said, you know, especially kind of where I live in, in, um, in the white reduction area, oh, like 20 years ago, you know, you didn't really see that many ticks. And now, you know, you're kind of starting to see more ticks. And so, and so this is interesting because they've kind of always been here. They, you know, they've been here for, for many thousands of years. Um, and so this, this brings us to um, my research question and, and, and why I find this, this, this problem to be particularly interesting. Um, and uh, there's no simple or straightforward answer to this question. Um, it's, it's a very complex and nuanced question, but to kind of start uh, sort of breaking it down, we actually need to start with a little American history. 
And so prior to the colonization of the Americas, uh, much of New England was forested and it was likely that ticks existed in some abundance. Um, and so the top uh, left picture, the 1700 AD pre-settlement forest is a depiction of what New England uh, likely looked like uh, pre-colonization, pre-settlement. Um, and this is all from a module uh, on the history of New England forest from the Harvard Forest website. I can provide anyone who's interested uh, a link. They have um, just a really cool module about the transition of forests over time. Uh, so I highly recommend checking it out. But um, And so kind of moving down to the bottom sort of left picture. So by the 1830s, um, sort of, sort of post-colonization, um, a massive portion of New England had been clear cut to accommodate for farming. Um, and so we're moving, you know, we're jumping forward 130 years and a lot of individuals have colonized the area and have started, started you know, some small scale and medium scale farming. Um, and, and, and most of New England was clear cut to accommodate this. Um, and so this provided very little habitat, um, good habitat for ticks and their hosts. And so it's thought that tick populations were likely bottlenecked in very small areas. Um, and so some research has suggested that the Cape Cod area is actually where tick populations were sort of like pushed out to and, and held for a long time. Um, but then as time wore on, um, we experienced the movement of large scale agriculture from New England to the Midwest and many farms were abandoned. And so that's the sort of middle picture on the top, 1850 AD farm abandonment. Um, and as time continues to sort of move along, uh, we begin to see the reestablishment of forests, um, although they are different in composition than they previously, previously were, um, starting with white pines. And so that 1910 AD old field white pine forest on abandoned farmland, um, and eventually sort of moving into the 1930s um, to more established continuous forested landscapes, which, uh, which brings us to today, to the present landscape. Um, and so it is this sort of landscape or in, in the, you know, in the past uh, 50 years that seems to be quite hospitable to ticks and it, and it might be contributing to the increase uh, that the, the previous study with the, the maps, the, the colored maps mentioned. And so there's been a lot of work uh, and, there, and there currently is a lot of work being done to try to understand this. Um, in the next few slides, I'll sort of run through some existing research that contributes to our, our, what we think is happening or what our understanding of this, of this phenomenon. And so the first is that our, our changing climate is likely increasing or is likely contributing to the range expansion of ticks. Um, and so as temperatures increase, tick populations are able to establish in areas that were previously inhospitable. Um, and so, uh, you know, there is quite a bit of interannual variability in, in the climate um, as, we're, as we're experiencing. However, overall trends um, in climate suggest that there is, a, is, a, is an overall warming. And so this, this 2012 study modeled range expansion of the black leg tick um, and projected the northern movement of ticks over time. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit hard to see, but this map, this color is sort of like a heat map. And so we move from like a highly concentrated area of where they already exist, their establishment and sort of starting in 2009 um, and prior, and then slowly sort of fade out into this yellow where it's expected that by 2030 ticks will be able to establish. So it doesn't mean that they will, it just means that the, the habitat, the climate will be suitable such that they could survive if they were to get there. Um, and so, and then this is sort of their, when this study was published, which it was, it was published in 2012, this was sort of their current uh, limitation range. Um, so other, other research has shown the effects of forest fragmentation on species composition. And so um, a study from 1998 has looked at the effects of forest fragmentation. Um, in this particular study, it was via logging on the density of mice. Um, and their results showed that the section of forest uh, that was fragmented contained a higher density of mice than the unfragmented forest. Um, and so this, um, this graph is sh sort of showing on this, this vertical axis is just the number of adult mice that were in this particular area, um, or, or sort of an axis of, of 
potential mice counts. And then this is time moving across from 1992, 93, 94. And so these circles are the fragmented habitat. And so we can see that the uh, the, the the number of, of small mammals, the, the abundance of mice is um, much higher than than the unfragmented forest part, uh, which is which are these triangles. Um, and this this pi the picture is just for illustration of, of fragmentation. Um, and so furthermore, additional research has also shown that fragmentation may also increase the number of ticks um, and their infection prevalence. And so um, this this has a lot to do with um, this. So I'll explain the graphs first and I'll kind of explain the overarching um, thought behind this. So, so this vertical axis is just the, the density of nymphs, which is that um, sort of adolescent life stage of the tick. Um, so the number of the number of ticks are really high when the area of a forest patch or fragment is very small, right? So as we fragment these these forest habitats, um, as sort of pictured for illustration here, um, as we fragment them smaller and smaller, we do see sort of a uh, a higher number of ticks. Um, and 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 as you sort of move to to larger patches of of land, we see fewer ticks, basically. Um, and also, there the den the 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 prevalence of infection. So what pathogens they're infected with also decreases as you increase land size. So when we have these really small patches of land, um, we have a really high number of ticks and a really high infection prevalence of ticks. And it is thought to so so fragmentation is kind of operating on a, on a on a larger scale in the sense that as we fragment pieces of land, um, we sort of release the um, the predation pressure for mice. So um, we know that ticks are sort of limited in their mobility, and so they they kind of have to eat what's in front of them. Um, and what is frequently in front of them in leaf litter are these small mammals. And studies have shown that as you fragment land, you sort of drive out the predators of these small mammals. And so you sort of, you allow these populations of small mammals, particularly mice, um, to, to, to increase, which basically provides just more, more meals um, for, for these ticks. And so as we fragment these, these pieces of land, smaller and smaller, the number of mice increase, the number of food for ticks increase, the number of ticks increase, and subsequently the number of infections um, or the number of pathogens, I should say, within these tick populations increase. And so another, another sort of perspective on this is um, acorns, particularly uh, masting events. And so uh, when trees produce a lot of seeds at once, I know 2019 was an incredible year for acorns. So it seemed like the, the like all of Vermont was just kind of blanketed in, in acorns. Um, and then subsequently, <laughs> the chipmunks and the squirrels and 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 everyone got kind of kind of kind of plump. Um, but they are also thought to to contribute to increasing small mammal populations, and that makes sense. Um, acorns and other seed producing trees that sometimes will have a spike in in resource production, seed production, um, are a primary source of food for for small mammals. And so this graph kind of shows that. Uh, the black is sort of an increase. So in 1994, there was a there was what we would consider a mass year, and then the very next year we see just an uh, an incredible amount of chipmunks um, that uh, that are around, and then sort of two years after that, after this mass increase, we see an increase in the number of ticks, right? And that and that kind of makes an intuitive sense because if we increase the food for the small mammals, which are food for the ticks, then we would expect to see an increased number of ticks. Um, and so, and so all of this is kind of leading to an increase, an overall increase in the number of, uh, of, of small mammals. And an another and perhaps uh, well, more well-known perception is that the increase of deer has contributed to the increase in tick populations. And deer are a very important host for adult ticks. Um, and are highly abundant in this area. And so they may significantly contribute to maintaining tick populations. Um, however, unlike small mammals, um, deer populations have largely stabilized in the past uh, few decades. And so it's, it's a little unclear as far as, far as from like a research perspective, whether or not they are contributing to the increasing tick populations. Um, 
it could be that they are. And because they're just such large mammals um, and they have such like sort of high surface area that they, their, their stabilization in their populations doesn't, it, it is still contributing to a tick population increase. Um, but we don't, we don't quite know if that, if that's the case, there have been sort of conflicting studies. Um, as far as I know, one way to sort of look at this would just be to count the number of ticks on deer. Um, as far as I know, uh, no one, no one is currently looking at that. Um, so we don't really know if, you know, this, this stabilization in deer is, is helping the tick population grow or sort of, you know, keeping it, keeping it sort of at a, at a minimal level or, or how it's contributing to this process. So, the last sort of um, little piece I'm going to talk about is how predators pray, play a role in the abundance of small mammals. And so um, if we think of these small mammals, again, as food for, for ticks, um, we can think about sort of this, this dynamic between interacting species, interacting populations of species. And so um, there are what, what we would consider these user predators, so like these mid-level predators, um, which are commonly fox, uh, raccoons, things like that, um, that will predate on smaller, smaller species of mammals and kind of from the top kind of push those populations down. Um, but then as in the past uh, like 30 to 40 years, we sort of see a re we've seen a reintroduction of coyotes into sort of the Northeast. And it, it may have been longer than 30 or 40 years. I don't actually know. Um, but, and so, Coyotes and fox have this interesting dynamic, and coyotes and other sort of mid-level predators um, have these interesting dynamics where coyotes will actually predate um, on on these sort of fox and these other mid-level predators, and so they'll they'll they'll, they'll exhibit sort of like an intraguild predation, um, which uh, has an indirect sort of benefit on these mice and these smaller mammals. So. Um, if a coyote is predating on a fox or a raccoon or other predators, mid-level predators that are that are commonly predating on these individuals, then these individuals experience sort of a, a little bit of relief um, from predation. And this and this could be contributing to, to the increase in them. Um, and again, um, as, as small mammal populations increase, whether it's from fragmentation, whether it's from more abundant resources, food for small mammals, or whether it's through sort of a release in um, predation pressure, um, the, the, the more small mammals there are, the more likely um, that a tick will encounter it and um, complete its life cycle, reproduce, and, and, and so on. So um, the facilitation of, of tick population increase is sort of um, a small mammal increase or a stabilization um, in, in small mammal populations. And so um, in New York, there was a study that looked at um, observation rates from bow hunter wildlife surveys. And it, 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 it looked at sort of correlations between um, the number of Lyme disease cases in, in New York state versus the number of coyote, coyotes and the number of fox that bow hunters saw. And so um, as the number of coyotes increased, they saw sort of a, 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 a not a decrease, but sort of a, a lessening or a, or a sort of a stabilizing curve of Lyme disease incidents. And where foxes decreased, they saw a, um, they saw a, um, an, an increase in Lyme disease. I'm sorry, where, where foxes increased, they saw a decrease in Lyme disease. And so, and so all of these, all of these processes and all of these different things are kind of all, all intermingled and all connected. Um, and so it presents a really unique problem to, to ascertaining why and how um, ticks are increasing or decreasing or changing in, the, in where they exist and, and, how, and how many there are. And, and in many ways, all of these things, as I just talked about, the landscape change for fragmentation, the increasing in climate, temp, in, in overall temperature and climate, the number of hosts, sort of small mammals increasing and, and how predators interact, they're all um, sort of connected and working simultaneously and exerting different forces on each other. And so it's, it's a very complicated problem to try to even begin to understand or test. Um, and it's so variable across space and time. And so the project we collaborated with on VINs was to start just very simply in investigating um, a few of these uh, these processes at a very local scale. 
And so we started by selecting three sites around the greater Hanover area. Um, two of the sites were on Vin's property and one was on Dartmouth owned land. And the site were the sites were approximately one hectare, which is uh, like roughly 2.5 acres. Um, and we wanted the sites to be sort of spatially independent from one another, but and at a similar elevation. And additionally, site selection is always um, you know, sort of conducted within the confines of where we, where, you know, someone will let us like walk all over their land and, and trap small animals. And so um, we kind of had to work within, within those bounds as well. And it, and at each of these sites, we were interested in characterizing um, three sort of different levels, right? And so we wanted to know, well, how are these different levels sort of interacting? And, and this has a lot to do with what I talked about earlier um, of sort of our current understanding of what drives what and how what how something is connected to another and exerts pressure. And so the way we decided to approach it was to um, characterize the what meso predators were sort of in the area. So understand like, you know, who's there? Um, are they there at the same time? Things like that and other very large mammals, right? So we know deer um, are a significant host for the, the adult stage of, of this species of tick. And so we wanted to understand sort of how, um, how they sort of use landscape and, and characterize them. Another level, which is this yellow um, middle section, were the small mammals, specifically mice. Um, so mice are known to be very good hosts um, as far as hosts for ticks. So they don't they typically won't groom them off. Um, and also uh, particularly white-footed mice are, the, are very competent, um, what we call reservoirs for the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. And so ticks don't, um, they're not essentially born with the bacteria that they transmit to humans. They have to collect it from an animal and then, and then transmit it to humans. And, and we know um, from many previous studies that mice are actually one of the most competent. Uh, so, th so they, Sort of transmit the most bacteria um, from themselves to the mouse or from themselves to the tick and then subsequently to humans. Um, and so we wanted to characterize, you know, sort of how many mice there were in these sites, um, what other small mammals could be there, things like that. And then the last thing being ticks. So we wanted to understand, you know, how many ticks were in the area. Um, and, I'll and I'll talk a little bit about, about each of these. So to start, um, when you're looking for sort of large or medium-sized uh, animals, um, they're difficult to catch. So we decided to set up camera traps um, and we set up two camera traps per site. So a total of six camera traps and we let them run continuously. They're actually still running continuously today. Um, and they are motion sensor activated and they take two quick shots um, every single time something, uh, something passes by. So we had thousands and thousands of pictures I would say maybe 80% of them were just leaves blowing in the wind. Um, but we got a, a few good shots of um, some, some meso predators. And in addition to characterizing the meso predators, we wanted to see, uh, or the meso predator community. And so by meso predator, again, I, I, I ref I'm referring to um, sort of coyote, fox, raccoons, things like that. In addition to the meso predator community, we also wanted to understand um, who else was sort of utilizing the space. Again, um, these, these ticks are generalists, so they don't, they don't really care who is, uh, as long as you're warm blooded, they don't, you know, they don't really care. Um, they are willing to, to take, take a meal from you. So we, we wanna understand who else was there. Um, and so we had a couple of, of really great visitors. The deer picture is perhaps my favorite picture from this whole, um, to the, yeah, this whole, it remind, he reminds me of my, that, that deer reminds me of my dog a little bit. <laughs> Just like caught in the headlights. Um, and lastly, we wanted to, or not lastly, I'm sorry, next we wanted to, to sample the small male community to understand what species were there, but also to determine the number of ticks that were attached to these species. Um, and so we understand sort of what bacteria are from which uh, small mammals, but we don't understand very well why ticks choose the animals that they do. Is there a preference? Is it, is it happenstance? Is it circumstantial? Um, and so we kind of wanted to just get a better idea of, well, how many, how many ticks are attaching to kind of to what species? And so again, we were, we were particularly interested in mice due to sort of the research behind that. Um, so at each site, we set up an eight by eight trap array. Um, so a total of 64 
traps using Sherman live traps, which are that, that middle picture. Um, they had little flags next to them, so we wouldn't lose them. And then each trap was baited with uh, peanut butter and oats for food, an apple slice for moisture, and then two cotton balls. <laughs> so it was a little, little mouse hotel. Um, and we sampled, we, we, we termed them sampling intervals. Um, and so we sampled three intervals uh, between the months of May and September. And each sampling interval lasted three consecutive days. So we would set the traps in the evening um, and we would check them early the next morning. And so each morning we would check all 64 of the traps to see if we, if we you know, if, if anything kind of decided to, to come by or not. And if the trap was triggered um, and contained an animal, we would bring it back to our sampling station um, and we would weigh the individual and then sex it and identify it to species. Um, with mice, we can't differentiate between the deer mouse and the white-footed mouse. Like morphologically, you can't, you can't really tell. Um, and so we just identified it sort of to the, to the genus, which is, is paramiscus. So you'll see paramiscus mentioned um, a couple of times. And then we would mark the individual using a buzzer. So we would just buzz a little, a little piece off their rump. Um, and this is just a temporary mark. It's actually the least um, invasive. And that was just to sort of let us know that we, um, we had caught this individual previously. Um, so we could just make note of that. Um, we would hold the individual as shown in the pictures and we would count the number of ticks that had attached to around the face, the neck and the ears. Um, and then afterwards, we would release uh, the individual at the point of where the trap location was. Um, and so we make the assumption that, you know, wherever the individual was caught, um, whichever trap it was caught in, it is most likely, it most likely lives pretty close to that trap. So we would just release it back at that, um, at that trap. And so lastly, uh, we sought to measure the number of host seeking ticks at each site. And so these are the ticks that are actively looking for a host. Um, and so they are kind of crawling up and out of the leaf litter. Um, and we did this by taking a one by one meter cloth and dragging it along a line that runs the length of our site. Um, and this is a common technique for sampling ticks. I'm sure uh, you guys have kind of seen it in the, in the you know, in, in health publications and things like that. People look for ticks um, pretty frequently actually up in this area. And, and this is kind of the most common way to do it. And so, uh, these red lines kind of running through the square with all the orange dot, dots over it, which are, are meant to, to, to denote where we sort of set each trap, um, would be the transects. And so we just kind of took a took a one by one meter cloth and dragged it all along that, that red line. And then again, um, and then at intervals along each of those lines, we would stop and flip the cloth over every like 15 meters or so. And we would look to see if any ticks had attached to it. And any ticks that we saw um, on the cloth, and uh, they are they are pretty difficult to see. We put them, we remove them with tweezers, very fine fine needle nose tweezers, and put them in ethanol. And then later in the lab, we would put them under a microscope um, and identify them to species and by what life stage they were in. So. Um, on the very right hand side in the conical tube that those are a bunch of larvae that we um, came across and picked off that the little white sheet and then the picture to the left um, is an adult female exodes uh, scapular deer tick. And so to kind of move to the results section we're still sort of working through all of our learnings um, from 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 everything that we gathered and sort of cleaning up the data, but I wanted to show a little bit of what we've done. Um, and so this, what you're looking at is you're looking at um, on this vertical axis, you're looking at um, a presence or absence uh, measurement. And so the numbers don't really matter as much as the one or sort of the nothing down, down sort of where the, the intercept is. And um, I'm sorry, this, the zero is. And so, the one, um, the, the line sort of where the one is, and I'm sorry, the x-axis is across time. So we're just looking at it across time um, between each of the three sites. So site one, site two, and site three up at the top. And so the triangles are red box and the blue squares are coyote. And so this graph is just for us to get an understanding of were these individuals, were red fox and coyotes at the same site at this around the same time, right? And so we want to know if these individuals are acting, or I'm sorry, interacting. 
And so in order for us to understand if they're interacting or if there could be any sort of sort of predation pressure from a coyote to a red fox, we wanted to, to understand um, if these species were just even in the same area together, you know. And so for instance, in site three, we didn't encounter any red fox. Um, and so that'll be, that'll have to be sort of a, a future consideration for us. But at sites one and two, you know, we did see both of those individual species at each of these sites. Um, and they do kind of seem to be around the same time. So, you know, there might be potential for interaction. This is, again, um, it's, it's a little bit of a small sample size, so it's hard for us to kind of um, say anything for certain, but um, it, it seems to kind of be the case. And so um, this next part, uh, this next graph, and I apologize, I know it's very small. It's, it's um, something I'm still trying to, to fix a little bit, but this, um, this figure is just showing the, the types of animals that we caught in the small mammal traps. So those green little diamonds that you see, those are all mice. We caught, we caught a, quite a few mice, um, many, many mice. As far as everything else, um, we didn't catch too much of anything else, but I will quickly just go through what everything, just everything that we caught, um, which isn't too many, aren't too many, isn't too many things. Um, so this little blue circle up here, um, is a northern short-tailed shrew. Um, these red pluses right here at sites one and sites two are southern flying squirrels, or I, I should say flying squirrels. Um, we think that they were southern flying squirrels. We are not certain, but we 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 are making an educated guess. Um, so from some flying squirrels, they were um, pretty upset to be ha to have been caught in a in a ground trap, but. Um, a lot of paramiscus, which is again, um, mice, it could be deer mice, it could be white-footed mice. We're not really making that distinction. Um, we caught a couple of chipmunks at site two, um, which, was, which, was, which was pretty interesting. We caught um, an American red squirrel at, at site two. And we also caught a meadow jumping mouse at site two. And that's, and that's interesting, um, just sort of anecdotally, because we caught quite a few different species at site two, Whereas in site one, we only caught really three different species. And in site three, we caught very few of any species. And so that's sort of an interesting distinguishment between, between the sites. Um, and then we looked at, we wanted, and so we wanted to say, well, what were the differences between sites? Um, you know, so were there any differences? And so we looked at the weights of mice between sites. And we wanted to say, well, are some mice fatter than others? And could that have implications for how many ticks are attached to them? And, and, and sort of a question like that. And so we found that there was no real difference in weight between, in the weights of mice between sites. So they were all pretty equally healthy, healthy, um, healthy size. However, interestingly, we did find some, um, some differences between the number of ticks that were attached to each mouse um, between sites. And so sites one and sites three, site one and site three, we found actually more ticks attached to individuals than we did at site two. And that's interesting because if you'll remember at site two, we found a, a higher diversity of species. And so we, we kind of are wondering, you know, we're seeing this very, um, we're seeing this, sort of anecdotal pattern that we're observing in these data visualizations and we're wondering, oh, well maybe, you know, perhaps the diversity of species at site two is allowing for ticks to attach to different species um, rather than the mice. And that may explain why um, we see two, we see sites one and site three have, um, have higher tick burdens on mice. So, so it, it's really, um, it's really preliminary at this point. We're working with a really small sample size, but this is just kind of what we've observed in the data. Um, and so as far as uh, future directions go, um, right now we're kind of in the exploratory analysis phase. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot, we collected some really interesting data. It is a small sample size, but there's, you know, there's some things that we can do with it. And so we're still kind of exploring what those things could be. Um, a very common thing to do in sort of this line of work is to sort of generate a model to, to help explain some of the patterns in a, in a more simplified way and not necessarily explain the patterns, but, um, to generate um, an idea or a potential uh, a, a potential explanation as to why we're observing these patterns and sort of validate it, um, and then a, and then a third option for us is to sort of refine these very broad questions and and make them much more specific so that you know we're not sort of measuring a bunch of different things but we are we're measuring very specific things. 
um, so that so that is kind of the conclusion of my project um, and sort of what we've been working on. Um, but I think I would be I know I'm running um, a, running out of time a little bit, but I think I would be a little remiss if I didn't talk about birds because this is an Audubon Society meeting, and um, I would love to just spend a minute talking about I don't I don't know very much about this topic, but the role of birds in the distribution and abundance of ticks. Um, and again, I can't speak much to this, but um, it kind of makes intuitive sense given some bird species incredible migration patterns. You know, um, we do know that ticks attach will attach to to some species of birds, um, and we do you know there are ground dwelling birds. And I um, am definitely not the expert here, but um, it, it sort of makes an intuitive sense. And so I. Uh, looked around and found a few studies, and I'd just like to share a couple with you uh, that I found to be interesting. Um, so there are people who are interested in sort of doing research and looking at how birds carry ticks across space. And so, you know, there's a hypothesis that um, birds are, are one of the primary dispersal um, sort of mediums for moving ticks to the Northeast, moving ticks to the Midwest, and, and, and so on to the South. And so, and that makes sense. Um, and so this study, used a, a stable hydrogen isotope analysis um, on bird feathers um, to on the tail feathers to determine how far Ixodes scapularis ticks were being uh, distributed. And so basically they took tail feathers from the birds and they ran a stable isotope analysis on them and were able to determine where that bird um, sort of nested in the sort of in the, this was done in Canada, so in, in, the, in the northern parts of Canada. Um, and then they checked the um, the birds for ticks, or 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 looked at previous studies um, for for tick burdens, and, and sort of um, looking at seeing to see if these if these if these migratory birds are capable of of dispersing ticks long distances. So we have birds that we we know have ticks on them, and then we're sort of using the stable isotope analysis to look at well where do these birds go or where are they from and sort of looking at how they move ticks kind of across their, their migration routes, um, which I thought was really interesting. Um, the, a little less, the next two tables are a little less uh, visually pleasing, um, but the, the authors of this paper uh, conducted a quantitative review at the scale of North America to identify the like avian life history um, correlations of tick and infestation and, and pathogen prevalence. And so they did a study um, and across the, all of the studies in the sort of their review, 78 of the 162 bird species harbored ticks. And they calculated these like species level um, indices of importance for carrying ticks. And so you'll see sort of the name of the species, how many sites the species were, were at. And then this index of species importance is, um, it was calculated by, estimating the species continental population size, so how many of, of each bird there are on the continent, uh, by the mean tick density, so the, the total number of ticks found on the birds divided by the number of birds sampled. Um, so, it, so um, you know, the northern cardinal is uh, seemingly prolific um, in facilitating uh, tick distribution. So, and, and same with the American robin. And so that's, I, I thought that was kind of interesting. And then the, this last um, this last table, again, it's, it's a little busy, um, but this was a model to investigate the role of southward migrating songbirds um, in the dispersal of deer ticks uh, within the continental United States. And so the, the sort of aim of this study was to generate a model that would investigate um, that modeled the dispersal of two highly studied migrating songbird species, the, the wood thrush and the oven bird. And they, in this model, they predicted that the annual dispersal of, um, of these two species was more than 4 million ticks. So that's an incredible amount of ticks just by these two species alone. Um, and these, these two species, the wood thrush and the oven bird, um, dispersed ticks as far west as the Dakotas and as far south as central Alabama. So they're really facilitating the movement of ticks. Um, the model also demonstrated that um, there were three sort of specific songbird traits, which are the breeding rage, the migration timing, 
and the propensity for tick attachment. So like how easily a tick can, can attach to an individual. Um, all three of those things play major roles in the magnitude of, of tick dispersal. And so this, this table is, um, the colors represent the potential impact of these like species specific uh, characteristics, which I, I just kind of talked about on the magnitude of dispersal of dispersal in relation to each host species. And so for instance, um, the attachment rate compared to the wood thrush. So in the veery, it's greater and that has a high, a really high impact because it's highlighted in red um, on the dispersal of ticks, on, on the probable dispersal. Again, these are predictions, um, but yes. Uh, so um, yeah, so, so I, found that I found all of these three studies to be really interesting. They all really focus on, um, yeah, just birds' abilities because of birds' very uh, high dispersal rate and high movement, um, how they facilitate ticks, tick movement across, across space. So I thought that is a very interesting um, thing. So um, thanks, thank you everyone um, for listening to my talk and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, and yeah, thank you. Great, if folks have questions for Caitlin, you can just unmute yourself and ask them. Or if you are, if you prefer to type them into the chat box, you can do that too. So Caitlin, do you have any interest in, in uh, working with birds in the future to, to understand, just understand this? I mean, doing studies of birds as well ticks on birds and yeah yeah i mean i think it i think it it would be um it would be silly not to consider birds in sort of this community like this community context so you know i talk a lot about the predators and hosts of ticks and birds serve as that um as 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 definitely like a host um and and a potential predator of ticks as well um right birds are um you know there's it's such a massive group um, and it's such a diverse group that it, it is truly sort of its own discipline of study within within this discipline. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to incorporate, yeah, like maybe a little bit of mist netting or something uh, into, into the sites that we currently have. Um, but it, it takes, yeah, it takes a lot of, a lot of um, knowledge, like foundational knowledge about, about those techniques that I, I, I don't have currently, but yeah, I think it would be really interesting. It's interesting that the, the, the ground feeding birds would make does make it makes the most sense that they would be most prone to it yeah the, like oven birds and thrushes of yeah like that mm. that's fast, fascinating that would never have occurred to me actually <laughs> caitlin someone have, in the chat box go ahead go ahead holly so i have a question you talked about red fox a lot, but you didn't talk about gray fox. And yet in your trail cameras, you're showing gray fox and they're sort of different habitats. So I was just mm. wondering about that. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Yeah, so we do have some results on the gray fox. Um, I, I particularly talk about the red fox because um, that is sort of this, this. Uh, this hypothesis of these like coyote red fox interaction is sort of couched within a larger hypothesis that was that has been previously modeled. Um, and so I, so as for background, I, I sort of explained it within the context of red fox. Um, but you're right, there are there are gray fox as well. Um, and I don't know as much about um, their natural history um, and sort of their potential interactions with with coyotes. That's kind of something we're sort of still looking at the data from. But you're absolutely right. We we have sort of um, seen, seen both of those, those individual species. Hmm. Um, someone in the chat box requested that you talk about the predators of ticks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, tick, so because ticks are really hard to sort of observe in nature, um, mortality capturing how ticks die and how um is, is is quite difficult right because when we sample when we're sampling for ticks we're really not getting a true sample of how many ticks there actually are we're only getting a sample of how many ticks are actively looking for hosts um the tick life cycle again is, is two years and, and, a, and a good portion of that is spent in sort of the developmental stage um you know the, the, it takes a it takes a while for them to feed it takes a while for them to um molt and so 
we have some idea of the, the predators that are involved in um, tick mortality. So for instance, there's a species of spider that predates on, on ticks. It's mm -hmm. not that the biggest mortality or the biggest contribution to mortality in a tick population is really, you know, um, inhospitable climate. So um, really dry, temp really dry uh, conditions. Um, fun fungal infections are, are a very common um, mortality factor in ticks. Species of spiders, um, some some birds, although that's that's really hard to sort of quantify. We do know, you know, some birds will, if they're there, they will eat them. You know, I don't I don't know a chicken that would refuse a tick. Um, and ticks that it, some some animals, some some small mammals have a very low what's called a permissibility. So they'll have a tick that's attached to them, and they will in fact just remove the tick and, and eat it uh, and consume the tick. And so it's just a part of their grooming behaviors. Um, and so there are varying degrees of, of and so that that could be, you know, considered a, for, a form of, of predation, if, if you will. Um, and so, yeah, so it, it's hard to quantify, but we do know um, some, some species of soil arthropods. So, you know, spiders, things like that. Um, yeah, I, I hope that it, it yeah, there's no like primary predator of ticks, unfortunately. Um, it would be that would be really cool to study. Um, but yeah, we know some of the mortality factors and some of some of the players involved. So is it, is it true what they say about opossums being uh, good good tick eaters? Do you know anything about that, or is that just? Yeah, that's a really interesting thing. Um, I, I I I know of the study um, and. Yeah, I so I I know that as as far as 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 we know, there's no evidence to suggest that possums will actively seek ticks out um, and 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 eat them. Um, and so, you know, they're they're not predating on ticks in that way. If a bunch of ticks are attached to an opossum, um, they they have very low permissibility, so they will groom them off and consume them. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's kind of, it's kind of, it depends on how you look at it, I suppose, you know, I, I wouldn't call them a major predator. However, mm. you know, there are quite a few possums and their populations, I, I think are, are sort of on the rise, hopefully. And so, um, you know, as far as like a significant predator or, you know, controlling the tech populations, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with that, but, um, you, they tend to groom themselves and, and remove ticks. Hmm. Interesting. If possums um, are more um, fastidious, I guess, about grooming themselves, are they less likely to contract Lyme disease or become a carrier of Lyme disease, I should say? Yeah, um, that's that's a great question. Um, so I would have to look at, I mean, I, I don't know sort of the like immunological response of each individual. Um, I know that, um, so there's this concept of like reservoir competency and there's just a gradient of animals that kind of fall along that, right? And so we view white-footed mice and it's very well established that white-footed mice are really highly competent reservoirs, which means that they can harbor the bacteria that, that causes Lyme disease in humans, they can harbor it um, quite successfully. They um, and they're sort of a, and actually the American robin, I think can too. Um, I would have to double check that, but I think that, you know, for some reason that's sticking out in my mind. Um, but, and then, but then on, on the other end of the spectrum there are, for instance, deer are, do not, they are not competent reservoirs. So, um, you know, to kind of put this within the context, um, if, uh, if, if, a, if a tick bites a mouse um, and it, it has, let's say for instance, a, a, a nymphal tick has, the bacteria in its in its mid gut, and it feeds on a mouse. It will it will give that mouse the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. That bacteria is, is able to mm. sort of persist and proliferate in that individual mouse. And then if another tick comes along that does not have that that pathogen and bites that same mouse, it will very likely um, consume sort of the, the the blood with the with the bacteria, and then become infected. Right. It is not the same for for deer. Deer across the board do not transmit that bacteria, that that Lyme disease bacteria. So they are what we would consider a dead end host, really? much like humans. Humans cannot. Yep, 
So, so deer, it's, it's, it's interesting because um, they're, they're very large. Um, they are, a, a, you know, they have been shown to be a pretty significant host for, for the adult stages of ticks, but yeah, they, they don't pass um, the bacteria on, so. So it could be a question of what's in the blood or what's in the fact that there is so much blood. Yeah. It's an animal. Yeah. Yeah. Wonder. So it's, you know, yeah, it's interesting. There are a t a tons and tons of hypotheses that kind of float around, um, you know, that look at sort of like biodiversity, um, mm -hmm. it, which is like, you know, analogous to monocropping. So if we have all of the same species and they're all really highly competent reservoirs for this bacteria, do we increase disease? Or if we have, you know, a non monocrop and we have a high diversity. And so there, yeah, a lot of, a lot of research in this area, um, super interesting. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Okay, other questions it's, it's, it, sorry, it, it sounded like you were in favor of more possums. And is, if, if I read that correctly, is there a particular reason for that? Oh, um, you know, I, I am, uh, yeah, as far as my own, uh, research goes, uh, I, I think that, um, possums, the possums may sort of contribute to, um, again, like sort of this hypothesis of increasing biodiversity decreases disease risk. And so, you know, um, hmm. Mm -hmm. opossums like may contribute to to sort of decreasing disease risk that's certainly a, a very um well thought out and well researched hypothesis um and yeah so having more of them around might be a good thing i don't know enough about uh opossum life history um and sort of species interactions to know if they're a good thing or a bad thing um i, I try not to take sides especially because you know i i really do love ticks i mean i know that they're um horrible for people and they and they you know cause debilitating diseases but i they are my research focus and i find them to be very interesting and so i try yeah, not to take a person you're, you're, re you're a researcher they're your babies i understand that yeah so <laughs> i try not to take us uh, to too much of a, a personal stance on, on these things <laughs> so can you speak to ticks and moose Oh yeah, that is a really interesting. Uh, so that is a different species of tick. Um, that is what's commonly known as the winter tick, and they that is a very interesting um, species of tick. So it parasitizes um, cervids, and it is very frequently found on moose, um, and just in staggering amounts of. Um, so so the sort of like the burden, the tick burden on these, on these moose are um, incredible. And I know that there's a researcher at University of Vermont that's, that's um, sort of investigating this. Um, I think in collaboration with Vermont Fish and Wildlife perhaps. Um, and yeah, I mean, it is, they are these, the species of tick, um, it seems to have like a slight preference for these, for cervids, um, interestingly, but they're, they're also, they can be active during winter um, and, they they just aggregate on these on these moose and um pretty much like exsanguinate them you know they some you know the moose it, it it's really dangerous um for for you know like sort of younger moose and, and things like that so uh yeah very 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 interesting very um the moose are i feel are sort of already i think that they're on the decline um if i know um if I'm like remembering that correctly. And so this is not a good look for that. Um, but yeah, it is, it is very interesting for sure. Any final questions before we let Caitlin get on with our night? Great, well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for having me. And uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you.